Well, let's open our Bibles. Boy, didn't you like that clip from VBS? That was just the first couple of days. Wasn't that amazing? Yeah, I, I'm so bummed because this Friday uh, is water day. They always have a big dunk tank that they allow me to be in. I don't know how I got pick, picked for that assignment. Uh, and I love it every year. The kids love dunking me, and, and I love being dunked by the kids. You know, it's a blessing. But this year, but this year, I'm going to have to miss Friday. I'm going to be in San Diego. I know I have a previous engagement that I've got to be at. And uh, uh, but anyway, maybe next year, Lord willing. I think I think maybe we should ask Miss Sally to go into the dunk tank. All in favor? Uh, those opposed? <laughs> okay, only one opposed. Okay, fine. <laughs> The yeas have it. Sally's in. Ezekiel chapter, <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel 30. Now, last time we were together, we had finished up chapter 36. We saw how God had promised Israel redemption, that they would be restored, redeemed, that they would be renewed, if you will, how God would rebuild the city, he would cause the land to bear fruit, he would cause men and beasts to multiply, and that God would give them a new heart and a new spirit. These were wonderful promises that God made to Israel. Now, as we come to chapter 37, we come to the vision of the dry bones and the sign of the two sticks, and these are illustrative examples to drive home the fact that God's promises will come to fruition. And both the dry bones and the two sticks all point to and speak of the nation of Israel as a whole. And um, it, it not only points to and speaks of Israel coming out of Babylonian captivity and back into the promised land, but there's a yet future fulfillment as it pertains to the millennial kingdom. And we'll begin to highlight that in our study today. Now, here in chapter 37, uh, we've divided the chapter into two very simple parts. The first section involves the vision of the dry bones. That's verses one through 14, the vision of the dry bones. The second section involves the sign of the two sticks. That's in verses 15 through 28. So let's drop back and take a look at this first section. It deals with the vision of the dry bones. Now, uh, we've divided this first prophecy into two very simple sections. The first section, Ezekiel describes the vision, that's in verses one through 10. And second, Ezekiel explains the vision in verses 10 through 14. So, with that very simple outline, let's drop back and look at this first section as Ezekiel describes the vision. Look at verse 1, Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. So this is the vision of the valley of the dry bones. Now, according to verse 1, God took him out in the spirit into a valley. Now, he didn't physically go into the valley. This was a vision, much like back in chapter 8, in verse 3, when God took in a vision Ezekiel to Jerusalem, to the northern gate. He was still in Babylon, but it was like he was in Jerusalem. So this vision was very vivid. And so this is a very similar situation where God in the spirit, takes him into this valley full of dry bones. Now, drop down to verse 11 for just a moment, if you would, please. Look at verse 11. In Ezekiel 37, 11, it says, Then he, God, said to me, Ezekiel, son of man, these bones are the whole house 
of Israel. So there's no guesswork as to what these dry bones are all about. It's the whole house of Israel, which no doubt refers to the northern and southern kingdoms, Israel to the north, Judah to the south, more on that in a moment, as it pertains to all of them coming together as the whole house of Israel. But I think it could be looked at in two additional ways. First of all, as it pertains to the physical state of Israel, the physical state of Israel. Because during this prophecy, Ezekiel, of course, was in Babylon, Daniel was in Babylon, and the children of Israel were all captives in Babylon, as well as being scattered all around the world because these dry bones were scattered. So it, it, it could quite possibly be talking about the physical state of Israel, but I think a second way we can look at it is that it is dealing with the spiritual state of Israel how Israel was like a bunch of dry bones. In other words, spiritually, they were dead. Why? Well, because they turned their back on God. They rejected God, and they fell into idolatry. So when it talks about the whole house of Israel, I think it could be talking about their physical state as well as their spiritual state. And chances are some of us have probably experienced that at some churches that we've gone to. I know I have. Look, I've been to churches where, man, they are jumping up and down, running in the aisles, flopping like fish, barking like dogs. Uh, but they are dead. They're like dry, rattly, dead bones. Why? Because everything is external. It's all for the show. There's no internal intimate love relationship with God. It's all a put on, we might say. Well, uh, in verse three, this section continues dealing with Ezekiel describing this vision. Take a look at verse three. In verse three, it says, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Now, <laughs> when God asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. Uh, back in John's gospel, in John chapter 6, verse 5, with the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus turns to Philip and he says, hey, where are we going to get enough food to feed this multitude? But in verse 6 of John 6, it says, he said this, testing him, for he knew what he was going to do. So when God asks a question, it's not for his benefit, it's for our benefit. What's the purpose? Well, I think it, one reason is to cause us to make a U-turn in our life, turn toward the Lord, and begin to trust in the Lord. Well, in verse three, this goes on. It says, so I answered, Ezekiel gives the answer. He says, oh Lord God, you know. The NIV says, you alone know. The Living Bible says, you alone know the answer. In other words, <laughs> Lord, with man, this is impossible. But with you, it is possible. And that's kind of the idea that's going on here. And, and you know, as I thought about that for a moment, that, that really ministered to my life. Because chances are, many of us have or are, <laughs> or for sure will, go through some very, very difficult times in our lives. And sometimes we come to that place where we think, well, you know, my problem's just too big. And oftentimes that's because we think our God is too small. And unfortunately, we look at circumstances and situations in our life and we think, man, this is impossible. Oh, really? Well, it might be impossible for man, but it's not impossible for God. You know, Sunday uh, in Mark chapter 10, verse 27, it says, with God, all things are possible. We had mentioned that verse on Sunday. I think back to the book of Genesis. You know, in Genesis chapter 18, God appeared to Abraham, and Sarah was there at the door, and he gave Abraham a promise, the promise of a son, the promised son that was going to come. And the Bible says in verse 12 that Sarah laughed. Now, some think she laughed because, you know, I mean, it was funny. However, 
When God in Genesis 18 promised Abraham and Sarah a son, Sarah was 90 years old and Abraham was 100. So I think when she left, it was out of fear. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'd be scared to death, you know. 100, 90 years old, you're going to have a baby? Are you kidding me? But in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 18, it says, is there anything too hard for God? Wow. And if God can cause Sarah at 90 years old to have the son of promise, don't you think he can work out the circumstances in our lives? I mean, what's impossible for us and what looks impossible to us is nothing for God. Man, he spoke a word and the world's leapt into existence. So whatever we're going through, whatever we're dealing with, and, and I'm certainly not trying to minimize the difficulties that we experience in our life, I realize for us, it's, it's tough. It's a, it's a trying and terrible time when we go through these difficulties in our life. I get it. But the fact of the matter is, whatever we're dealing with, whatever we're going through, it is nothing for God to take care of. You say, well, Clark... When is he going to take care of it? You know, it's been about eight and a half minutes. When is he going to deal with my circumstance? I don't know. I'm not sure. You say, well, how will he deal with it? I don't know. Well, will he ever deal with it? Look, I said I don't know, and stop asking me. I'm not sure. It might be in this lifetime, or it might be in glory. He might resolve it the moment we die, and then it's done, you see? And we're in heaven. It's all good. You say, but I've been going through it for quite a while now. Your point? <laughs> you know, no matter how long we're on this earth, 80, 90, 100 years, it's still just a blink of an eye to God. It's nothing compared to eternity. And I think for each and every one of us, it's about keeping that eternal perspective. You know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.15, he said, or 4.18, do not look at the things that are seen. But rather, look at the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary. But rather, look at the things that are not seen. For they are eternal. It's about keeping that eternal perspective. I love that. Well, verse 4, this section continues. Take a look. In verse 4, again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. <laughs> Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, literally, the breath of life translated, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slains that they may live. So, verse 10, I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. So, God is going to bring these dry, dead bones to life, which ultimately is a picture of of God bringing Israel out of Babylonian captivity from death to the promised land, which is life. And it will see its ultimate fulfillment in the millennial kingdom. However, I think we have seen at least the beginning of a partial fulfillment of this, piggybacking, if you will, off of the Babylonian exiles as they came out of Babylon because Israel, these dry bones were put together um, 
beginning with what was called the Zionist movement in 1896 by Theodore Herschel. Uh, in fact, when we go to Israel, as we're driving north from Tel Aviv, we're on Highway 1, paralleling the coastline of Israel, uh, we drive through the town of Herzl, and there's a big picture and a statue of Theodore Herzl, who gained popularity with this Zionist movement, where he had a, a vision to bring Jews back into the country, and he's the one that actually revived the Hebrew language. So this was a, a big, big deal, having the Olim come back into Israel. And of course, I think we see even a, um, a little more of that fulfillment in, on March of 1948, when Israel became a nation. Not just a nation, but a nation today of over nine million inhabitants. So I think we're seeing the byproduct, if you will, of this prophecy coming to fruition even right before our eyes. Kind of interesting, on one of our trips to Israel, Sally and I were having dinner with Ronnie Winter and his wife Irit and, and some of his kids. And uh, today, she reminded me of that dinner because we were talking about the dry bones today. And she goes, she goes, oh man, she goes, do you remember what, 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 what happened at Ronnie's house at that dinner? I go, honey, I don't even remember what I ate for breakfast. So, so she brought me up to speed, and then it clicked, I remembered. We were having dinner at Ronnie. I mean, shalo, shalom and read. See, I couldn't even remember from today when we talked about it. <laughs> I said, Ronnie, it's shalom and read. Ronnie Winter, our tour guide, his wife's name is Irit. Shalom, the owner of the tour guide's wife's name is Irit. So I'm always kind of, conf- I should know the difference. I mean, I mean they're, one's old and the other one's not. But the point is, the point, I won't say which he read is. Okay, it's that he read. <laughs> but we were at their house having dinner, and Karen, their daughter, was there. And I don't know what brought it up. We were talking about maybe uh, Israel and how lush. Yeah, but, but I mean, it was lush, and, and you know, they're growing all kinds of stuff there, the breadbasket of Israel. And, uh, and we, somehow we brought up uh, Ezekiel 37 how it was a fulfillment, and, and Karen, the daughter, she piped in, she goes, we've been studying that in school. Because you know, in their history class in school, they study the Old Testament. That's their history book. In, in, in public school, that's their history book, is the Old Testament. And so she's going, oh yeah, Ezekiel 37, the dry bones, and she kind of gave a, a somewhat of a, you know, explanation about it. I said, yes. However, it doesn't stop there. And it goes into the millennial kingdom, which they don't talk about. Um, so I was able to share all that, and you, her eyes were open. It was quite a, quite a cool evening discussing Ezekiel 37 with that entire family. What a beautiful thing it is. But I think the point for you and the point for me is pretty simple. Before we came to faith in Jesus Christ, we too... We're like these dead bones, dry bones, just dead, lifeless, no hope, no direction, no fulfillment, no satisfaction, no life. But the moment we come to faith in Jesus Christ, once we receive him as our Lord and Savior, he breathes the breath of life into us by giving us his spirit. It's the spirit that brings life. Romans 8, 11, Acts 5, 32, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. And we've got the Spirit of God that gives us that life. And the life we have is not just for eternity. It's for here, it's for now, it's for today. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, it says the Spirit gives life. 1 Peter 3, 18. We are made alive by the Spirit. And the life that we have today, it is a life of fulfillment. And it really isn't dependent on what we have or where we're at or what kind of relationships we might be in. Because you know as well as I do, a lot of people today, they try to find fulfillment in something or someone. If I just had a little more of this or a little more of that, Well, if I could just meet Mr. or Mrs. Wright, then I would be satisfied. Then I would be fulfilled. Now, guys, I've got bad news for you. 
because I've married Mrs. Wright. I'm not sure what you're going to do. I, I, I just didn't know her first name was always. Okay. <laughs> okay, you just got that. Uh, she, well, I, I, she actually has a coffee cup at home, says, Mrs. Always Right. <laughs> I'm not making that up. She bought it for herself. No. This is, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Kind of. Let's come to the second thing we want to look at. True, she does have the coffee cup. We've looked at Ezekiel describing the vision. Number two, let's take a look at Ezekiel explaining the vision. That's in verses 11 through 14. Ezekiel explains the vision. Look at verse 11. Ezekiel 37, look at verses 11 through 14. It says, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off, just as we are apart from Christ. Therefore, verse 12, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up, from your graves. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So Ezekiel explains this vision in light of God opening the graves, putting the bones back together, giving them life, a new spirit, and bringing them back into the promised land. Now, there's a couple of ways we can look at this. One, it deals with restoring them as a nation because that certainly fits the context of them coming out of Babylonian captivity because Babylon's like a grave to them. That's where they're gonna die. So the grave is open, they make it all the way to the promised land and God gives them life. And that certainly is one way to look at it and it fits the context. However, I think there's a, another application, if not another interpretation, not just restoring them as a nation, but resurrecting them from the dead. Because literally, he's talking about opening the graves. Question, will the Old Testament saints be resurrected from the dead? The answer is yes, absolutely. They will be resurrected from the... Now, now, here's the picture. All of the Old Testament saints who died before the cross, they died by faith looking forward to God's promise of the coming Messiah. Old Testament saints are saved the same way we're saved, by faith. They believed by faith that God promised his Messiah and he was going to come. So they look forward to the cross. Whereas we... By faith, we look backwards to the cross that God's promised Messiah has, in fact, come. So we're all pointing to the cross, we might say. Now, the Old Testament saints will be resurrected from the dead. However, they will be resurrected from the dead at the end of the seven years of tribulation. Read Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Joel chapter 14, verse 14. So they're going to be resurrected at the end of the seven years of tribulation. And Lord willing, we're going to talk about that a little more when we get to chapter 38 next time we're together. Now, just as a side note, you and I, as believers today, will also be resurrected from the dead. We call it the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God shall blow, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Same thing in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. However, you and I will be resurrected or raptured before the seven years of tribulation. Why? 
Well, because the seven years of tribulation is a period of time when God pours out his wrath on a God-rejecting world from Revelation chapters 6 through 18 with the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. So this is a seven-year period of time is God's wrath being poured out. And the Bible is very, very clear. In 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul said that we are delivered from the wrath to come. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, God has not appointed us unto wrath. Same thing in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, we are saved from wrath. The Bible's replete. I do not believe we as Christians will go through the seven years of tribulation because we will not have to endure the wrath of God. Now, that's called a pre-tribulational rapture view. And that's what the view we hold, though good scholars have different views. They have a mid-tribulational rapture view, a pre-wrath rapture view, post-tribulational rapture view. Uh, there is the pan-tribulational rapture view. They're just gonna let it all pan out in the end. Uh, <laughs> but, and everybody's entitled to these different views uh, because I personally believe everybody has a right to be wrong. Now, back to Ezekiel chapter 37. Let's come to the second and final thing we want to look at. We said there were two sections in chapter 37. The first dealt with the vision of the dry bones. The second section deals with the sign of two sticks. That's in verses 15 through 28, the sign of two sticks. Now, the division of the second section is exactly the same as the first. So first of all, we see that Ezekiel describes the sticks in verses 15 through 17. Ezekiel describes the sticks. Look at verse 15 of Ezekiel 37. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, as for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it. For Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it. For Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. And for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick. And they will become one in your hand. So he's talking of the two sticks becoming one. Now this takes us back to the United Kingdom. Now you remember the first king of Israel was anybody? Solomon, Saul, yeah, not Solomon, Saul. No donuts for me. It was, it, I already had one. Um, <laughs> just in case I messed up. Yes, Saul, of course. Saul reigned. He was the king of Israel for 40 years from 1050 to 1010 BC. The second king of Israel was David. He reigned for 40 years from 1010 to 970 BC. The third king, of course, was Solomon, the son of David. He also reigned for 40 years from 970 to 930 BC, 120 years for the United Kingdom. Now, when Solomon died in 930 BC, the kingdom was divided. Solomon's servant, Jeroboam, became the first king of the northern kingdom called Israel, involving 10 tribes, the 10 tribes called Israel. Now, Ephraim was one of those 10 tribes. Ephraim was the largest of the 10 tribes in the northern kingdom. Therefore, often in scripture, we'll see the word Israel and Ephraim used interchangeably. So when it says Ephraim, it's referring to the northern kingdom called, caused it, called Israel. Now, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, became the first king of the southern kingdom called Judah, which was made up of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And I hope you're getting all of this. There will be a test after service. Now, this began the period of what we call the divided kingdom. So the 10 tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. So the first stick here is called Judah. Now Judah, of course, was taken into Babylonian captivity in 586 BC. The northern kingdom called Israel is the second stick. 
it was taken much earlier into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. So once again, God is going to take these two sticks, Judah and Israel, take them out of Babylon, bring them back into the promised land, and they will become one stick. And again, we'll see the ultimate fulfillment of that in the millennial kingdom. And Lord willing, we'll talk quite a bit more about that next time when we're in chapter 38. Now, Let's come to the second and final thing in this second section. We saw that Ezekiel um, describes the sticks. Now number two, Ezekiel explains the sticks. That's in verses 18 through 28. He explains the sticks, and it's very simple, very straightforward. Look at verse 18. Ezekiel 37, look at verse 18. And when the children of your people speak to you, say... Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says the Lord. Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, the ten northern tribes, also called Israel, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, not just Babylon, but all the surrounding nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two nations again. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And of course, this points to the ultimate fulfillment in the millennial kingdom. The more immediate fulfillment, of course, speaks of coming out of Babylon. Now, just as there were three waves of captives going into Babylon, the first was in 605 BC when Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah went into captivity. We know them a little better by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The next was in 597 BC. That's when Ezekiel was taken into captivity along with the 19th king of Judah, Jehoiachin, and 10,000 Jews according to 2 Kings 24. And the third and final was in 586 BC. So there were three waves of captives going into Babylon and there will be three waves of exiles coming out of Babylon. The first wave of exiles was in 538 B.C., led by Zerubbabel. The second was in 438 B.C., led by Ezra. And the third and final, of course, was on March 14th, 445 B.C., led by Nehemiah. So there will be an immediate fulfillment out of Babylon, but a greater future fulfillment in the millennial kingdom when, according to verse um, 22, God shall have one king over them, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the Messiah, when he will rule and reign for a thousand years, according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Well, this section goes on. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, it says, David, my servant, shall be king over them. Of course, David, a euphemism for the Messiah, the Christ, and they shall have one shepherd, as we saw in the previous chapters. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Now, this is interesting because there will be one shepherd, one king, who of course is Jesus Christ, who will rule and reign for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom. And here, God says, they will walk in my judgments and they will observe my statutes. Now, this becomes kind of interesting because you and I are going to be in the millennial kingdom. We are going to have our glorified bodies according to Philippians 3.21. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, we are going to rule and reign over men and angels. 
Who are we going to rule and reign over? Those who come out of the great tribulation. There's going to be a lot of people coming out of the great tribulation. Not just the 144,000 from Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 8, but according to Zechariah 13, 8, there's going to be one third of the Jewish population who's sealed and saved. And we'll talk a lot more about this uh, when we get to chapter 38 next time we're together. Hold that thought. According to verse 25, it says, Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where their fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell there. They, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. From Isaiah 60 and John 12, it's of course the Messiah. Moreover, verse 26, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in the midst forever. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify or set apart or made holy Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. So, as we've already mentioned, during this millennial kingdom, the one and true king, the God's true shepherd, is going to give them two things. He's going to give them his peace, and he's going to give them his tabernacle. Two things. Kind of interesting, because when we get to the book of Zechariah, the very last chapter in Zechariah chapter 14, beginning in verse 16 and on, during the millennial kingdom, you and I, are you ready for this? We are going to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem every single year to God's tabernacle to celebrate the feast of tabernacles. And part of that celebration involves animal sacrifice. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that next time we're together. But the good news for you and the good news for me is that we don't have to wait till the millennial kingdom <laughs> to have the king of kings and God's shepherd rule and reign over us. Because God's shepherd... The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Revelation 19, 16, is none other than Jesus Christ. John 10, 11, he's called the Good Shepherd. In Hebrews 13, 20, he's called the Great Shepherd. 1 Peter 5, 4, he's called the Chief Shepherd. And what does he do? He gives us two things. Number one, he gives us his peace. In fact, in John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Therefore, let not your heart be troubled, nor be afraid. It's that peace that passes all understanding, Philippians 4 declares. In fact, he's not just the giver of peace. Ephesians 2.14 says he himself is our peace. I think sometimes we pray <laughs> the wrong prayer. When we're going through difficult times, we say, oh, Lord, give me peace. I can see God look down, looking down from heaven going, you already have it. Hey, if you've got Jesus, you've got peace. He himself is our peace. But he's not just the giver of peace. He's given us the tabernacle as well. In John 1.14, it says the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Same thing in Revelation 21.3. God has given his tabernacle to men. You see, God's tabernacle is Jesus Christ. For you and I, from a practical, applicational standpoint, we might say, because he is our hiding place. He's our shield, our fortress, our buckler. We're under the shadow of his wings. He's our tabernacle. Man, we can run to him for safety. And what a beautiful picture this paints. Not just of the vision of the dry bones, but the sign of the two sticks. How God will bring it all together and give life. And that's exactly what Christ does for us. Father, what an incredible portion of Scripture. We're just so grateful, so thankful, Lord, for these few minutes together and, and an opportunity just to go over your word. And Lord, I pray that by your spirit, you would help each and every one of us, Lord, just to rest, to remember uh, the fact that you've given us your peace and you are our tabernacle. You're our high tower. Into you we run and find safety. 
And Lord, no matter what we're going through or dealing with, help us, Lord, never to forget that there's nothing too big or hard for you. Lord, if you can speak a word and the world's leapt into existence, Lord, we believe by faith that you can deal with any and every issue on our plate today. And Lord, I pray that by your spirit, we all would just remember that and rest in it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.